Yeah, so I was slightly drunk last night, staggering down the street, and I was grabbed and said, you are going to do the closing keynote. Um, I think this is how the British Navy has supplied their staff for centuries, so why shouldn't it not work for this conference? Um, is anybody going to put a clicker into my hand? The clicker? All right, thank you. Okay, so before I won't make this too long, um, obviously, task for the closing note is get you all energized and excited as you go home and apply everything that you've learned, which is why I'm going to tell you why we all suck at what we do. Um, but first, two announcements that I've been asked to make. The HR department wants me to announce that we are hiring. And the marketing department wants me to announce that please subscribe here, ring that bell there, buy me a coffee over there. Did I do that properly? I've looked at a famous, I look, I've looked at a famous YouTuber doing that. So um, I will speak a lot about the difference between software engineering and civil engineering here. Or, or actually, there shouldn't really be much of a difference, but there is. Except I'm not moving on. Like, now I'm moving on. OK. Um, can we start with a show of hands? Who of you has engineer in their job title, no matter in which combination? So that's roughly like between one half and two thirds. Um, so did I before I became a suit. And uh, I claim that a lot of what we're doing is uh, not actually engineering. And, uh, but before I make that point, um, I think we are at a point in history where, thanks to the pandemic, we have a chance to fix a few things in our profession that uh, may be greater than in a long time, because finally things are in motion again. Uh, but since I've been asked many times, including several times at this conference already in the hallways, um, I want to briefly say a few things about what was the pandemic like at KDAP. And if I'm using the past for the pandemic, that's because I live in a country where this really is the past, hopefully. And uh, nobody speaks about this anymore. Um, I guess that's what happens if you have Russian nukes 150 kilometers from your capital. So the, obviously at the beginning, we were just as scared as everybody else, mostly because nobody knew what was going on. Um, but it turned out that the disruption to our daily work was a lot less than we thought well, it could be, because about 60% of our staff used to work from home anyway. Not everybody who had a desk in an office came into the office every day to begin with. So we were all set up for remote. I wouldn't say we were... You sometimes see job ads where companies say they are remote first. Um, I'm not saying we are remote first, but we are certainly not uh, at your desk first either. So it's, it's rather a hybrid setup. And um, project teams have always been distributed. We've never assigned project teams by geographic proximity, uh, which uh, was good for us in this case, because people were used to work with each other across many different time zones. Sadly, Administrative and sales and sysadmin staff was uh, more affected, obviously, because there is more, especially for the admins, there is a lot more paper still involved, mostly not by our choice, but because authorities make us do so. Um, so for them, it was harder. They wouldn't always, our engineers travel a lot anyway, so they, they would all have laptops anyway, and they are prepared to work from pretty much anywhere there's a coffee machine. Um, not so much the case for our, lab, for our admins, so we needed to get them laptops or other equipment that they could set up at home. And in times of supply shortages, this was not always easy, and it continues to be difficult, as you probably all have experienced. We also noticed quickly that the social isolation was one of the hardest problems. And we didn't expect that so much because a lot of us just sit at home and work from home all day, any day. But of course, 
in non-pandemic times, you go out in the evening, go to your sports, play football with your team, or dancing, or go to a concert, or whatever it is you're doing uh, in, your, uh, in your social life. And all of a sudden, that was not possible anymore. And in some of the countries where we have Kadabians, Italy in particular was particularly badly affected. Um, our guys were pretty much locked up in their apartments for weeks at a time. So when we realized this, we, we, speak, to, we speak with each other a lot, given that we're a mostly virtual company. But we actually put this more into system that we checked in with everybody frequently, distributed across team leads and management. Um, there's only so much you can do if you're in isolation yourself, but at least what you can do is acknowledge these are hard times. I understand this is bad for you guys. I understand this is bad for you in particular because you have these uh, particular issues in your country. Um, at least observe, notice, and uh, provide some comfort. There's not a whole lot more that you, can, that you usually can do. And then, of course, there are all these problems for the engineers. So you were used to work from home. All of a sudden, there was contention for the kitchen table because their partners also ran their Zoom meetings from home. And daycare closed. Lot, uh, huge problem for those of us who still have, sm uh, who have small children. And obviously, daycare closed unpredictably. Uh, frequently, our guys would show up in the morning and say, oh no, daycare, daycare, they had a case at daycare, and they just send, I need to pick up my kid, and they just send everybody home. Not easy to get things done, <laughs> quite obviously. It's certainly very hard to get things done if you have a, a very, an active three-year-old screaming around you. Uh, all you can do as a company at that point is show understanding, Make this known to the customer, look, this is difficult. Uh, we may not uh, produce as much right now as, uh, uh, as we usually do. And pass that message on to our own engineers. Look, we see this is difficult. Try your best, and if this is all you can get out of your best, then we will certainly understand. And then, when the pandemic started, we had our big company meeting, which is where we all meet about roughly once a year. We had that only two weeks away, so we canceled that with two weeks' notice. We've postponed it several times. Since then, um, we are making a new attempt in September now, uh, unless something crazy happens with the world. Uh, hopefully, we can get this done this time. So, things are in motion now. And as this gentleman, Sir Winston Churchill, said, never let a good crisis go to waste. He was actually, what he was alluding to was the um, foundation of the United Nations um, as a direct result of the Second World War and the, um, the Soviet-British-American uh, alliance against Germany and Japan. But it fits in many situations because crises shake things up. Things at many workplaces, even very conservative workplaces, are shaken up now. Because even in companies where management said, no, you all need to work from your desk, because how am I otherwise seeing that you're working? Which I always found to be a not very stringent conclusion, because, I mean, clearly you can see whether there's working software coming out at the end of the day, no matter where the developer was set. But still, we know from many of our customers that that's how things worked. And then the governments, governments all around the world said, but you must send your guys home now. So all of a sudden, it was possible. And no, no, all of our code must never leave our campus because it's going to get stolen. Well, all of a sudden, it was possible. Um, certainly, this was not because management in big conservative companies came to the insight that, oh yeah, maybe we've, we've all been wrong for years. It was because governments forced them to. But that's still a chance. Some of these things may not be as cast in stone. So we, right now, we have a chance to actually use this to our advantage. And I've quoted the old adage here, if engineers build bridges the way software developers build software, the first woodpecker to come along would destroy civilization. And 
Sadly, that is a bit the case. There's so much crappy software out there. We so much put up with it. On the way to the airport uh, on Monday morning, Android Auto, my phone would not connect to Android Auto, or rather and the Android Auto on my phone would not connect to my car. I already knew, knew what to do. Uh, turned into a parking lot, stopped the car, turned off the engine, opened the driver's door because that's necessary. It's not enough to turn off the engine, closed the driver's door, turned the car engine on again, and then I knew the phone would reconnect. And I'm putting up with this. It's, it's not like I have a choice, but still, we're putting up with so many things in crappy software. I'm not going to say what kind of car brand that was because they're pretty much all crappy, the, um, the integrations. So does it have to be this way? In science, you usually say, first you formulate the problem or the question that you're trying to research, then you state a hypothesis, and then you come up with a proof for that or a disproof. And I would say for us, I'm stating the problem here, the software quality that our industry as a whole produces is just not good enough. Um, I will suggest one or two solutions. Um, they will by nature be very general because this will be very much dependent on what kind of software it actually is you're producing, what kind of work environment you're in. Um, get buy-in is something that you will have to do with your colleagues, with your managers, and then execute is all obviously something you all need to do together. So why don't we do proper engineering? Because I think we all want to. We all want to be proud of the software we are creating. We all want to go home in the evening and say, well, I wrote this awesome module today, and I know this is going to, uh, in 20 years from now, this will still work as beautifully as it does today, because this is so perfectly crafted. And um, sadly, that's not usually the case. And why is that? Well, the daily deadline grind is certainly a reason for that. I usually, I usually tell my own staff, nobody pays for a 100% solution, so aim for a 95% solution. But what we're actually getting in large parts of the industry, and that's something that we're really trying hard to avoid at KDAP, is the 50% solutions. And that's not cool. Sprints are another case. I'm all for agile programming everything, but the ticking clock of one week or two week or whatever your interval is, sprints means that very rarely will the things that don't give you function points on the burn down chart, uh, will they ever be selected? I mean, when was the last time a product owner or your management or your customer told you, now in the next sprint, um, let's devote 30% of the time to fix code smells or let's fix the build system. I mean, if you are in such a situation, then you're already really lucky and you can leave the room now because I have nothing new to tell you. But most of us are not in such a situation. And I have the confidence to say that because at KDAP we have so many projects with so many different customers running all the time and we see what things are like. So if we were able to build a culture where we say in every sprint or in every whatever other iteration you are using, we are devoting a certain part of our time to keeping our code clean, to avoid code, uh, <coughs> code rot, to making sure the build systems are smooth, to apply the things Kevin talked about in his talk. If we come to that point, then we've gotten a lot further to being real engineers and not just software engineers. And please take this uh, with the, as the tongue-in-cheek. Uh, statement that it is intended to be. So what do I think are signs for things not working as well as they're supposed to be? Well, many, it's been many years since continuous integration was invented. We've had talks here about continuous integration. Do we see continuous integration everywhere? No, sadly not. Not everywhere, not for all projects, not for all build combinations. And the worst thing we see is continuous integration, but nobody cares about the results. It's going all red across the dashboard, but nobody cares because nobody told the, the engineers to care. And 
when you ask, and say, oh, well, oh no, no, yeah, oh, that, yeah, that build, that's failed for half a year now. Um, uh, nobody's been assigned to fixing that. In that case, you're just consuming, your CI is just consuming energy worthlessly. So you want, you want a working CI, certainly. You want to test all the possible meaningful combinations. And you want a culture of, if it breaks, we'll fix it. If there is a cold smell, we'll fix it. Another thing that I often find lacking is a culture of ownership of code. And that goes both ways. What I would really like to see across all our in industry is open source thinking in companies, even in commercial companies. And by that, I'm not meaning you must release all your secret uh, code as under the GPL or anything. By that, I mean within your project, within your organization, let everybody look at the code. Not just the module owners, also the module users. Um, and you'd think, well, that's obvious. No, it's not. It's not obvious everywhere. So, um, and a culture of, if I see something that's wrong, I can go look at it. I can, in cooperation with whoever the module owner is, I can go ahead and fix it. That would go a long way as well. On the other hand, if everybody's in charge of everything, nobody is in charge of nothing. So I'm not saying that there should not be any ownership of code. We all own this code collectively, because then there needs to be a sense of ownership. But that sense of ownership must not be, I'm building an island here or a fortress. I'm, it really scares me if I come into an organization where I, it's not, it's not something that they will tell me right away, but where I quickly notice that the developers, or not just software developers, actually any kind of knowledge workers think that if only they know about a certain thing, then they are unfireable. And if that's why they are unfireable, then something's really wrong. So at KDAP, we have this. Um, and this is something that we tell everybody in every single job interview. We have this culture of helping each, each other. It's always OK to ask for help. Obviously, first you try it yourself. You read the fine manual. Uh, and then if you're still stuck, please do ask your colleagues for help. Because they may have already solved the problem, and they can help you in five minutes. And it would have taken you two hours, or two days, or two weeks to research the problem. And everybody is encouraged to, if they can contribute, to actually help. And they will certainly not be reprimanded for taking those minutes or hours, as it may be, away from their own project that they are working on right now. And I usually I use one tagline in interviews. I usually tell people, we've never fired anybody for asking for help. But we have, in one case, fired somebody for not asking for help. And being stuck, this is long, long ago. Nobody remembers, but for being stuck uh, with a project and then not asking for help. And the first time I learned about this was when the customer called me and said, why is this not done? So a, a hybrid system of certainly there should be one team or one person feeling responsible for a module, but not, uh, not isolating this from the rest of the company. That is the environment that we strive to build at KDAP and that I would like our whole industry see to build. And if you, if you see my slide, if you hear me speak, you hear me use the word culture a lot. And that's what I, usually, what I think it usually amounts to. This is about culture. This is about building a culture, a culture of collaboration, a culture of not accepting that things are bad, a culture of, it's not about, but our tools are bad. It's usually not, we're still, say it. It's not a tools problem. Whenever we have a discussion about this, Till usually says, it's not a tools problem. And he's usually right, because it's, it very rarely is. I mean, there are really, there are really poor tools. I mean, there is Microsoft Teams. Yes, I know. Um, 
but <laughs> most of the time, the cultural problem is much bigger than the tools problem, if there is a tools problem at all. So, I'm also already over time. So, if you leave this room now, I hope that at least a few of you take this along, thinking that, okay, maybe it doesn't have to be this way. Maybe my life at work can be better by trying to fix these things. I will work with my colleagues, I will speak to my managers about this, uh, and I'm sure this is going to be horribly firing back at me on Monday morning uh, in my own organization, but uh, I will put up with that, especially since I'm going to be on a flight and won't have internet access anyway on Monday morning. So, take this along, and if you absolutely, positively can't fix things where you stand, there are options. Thank you very much. And here's the sad truth about everything. Game over, player one. This is the end of the conference. It was super awesome seeing you all in real 3D again, and uh, knowing that you weren't just uh, checking your email while we were talking together. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, have a safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you.